Good morning, everyone, and welcome into Wake and Take. It's your boy, Jason, and we've got some football to talk about today. We're going to be covering all of the stories from this weekend uh, with some updates on Geno Smith, Derrick Henry, Saquon Barkley, Aiden O'Connell, LeJerry, Sneed, all sorts of random stuff coming out this weekend that we will discuss. And then also this morning, I ran through the PFF mock draft tool, did a round, first round, so we'll kind of talk about some of the stuff I think might happen in this year's NFL draft. So we've got a good one lined up for you guys. Go ahead, take out your coffee, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, so welcome in everyone. Glad to see you all in the chat this morning on YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter. No Facebook because StreamYard didn't want what just wasn't working going to Facebook this morning. So whatever, whatever. We don't need Facebook this morning. We'll be discussing the news. We'll be discussing my mock draft. Let's go ahead and get right on into it. And we'll start. Well, I'll just go ahead and preface this episode. A lot of this episode is going to be quotes from people important to organizations, whether it be quotes from general managers, quotes from owners, quotes from coaches, coaches or quotes from players. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that. So uh, let's go ahead and get right on into it. We'll start with Ryan Poles talking about Justin Fields. He called it the hardest thing he's ever had to do, which is kind of crazy. Uh, I imagine this man has had a lot of hard decisions in his life, and I'm sure trading away the quarterback that you've already decided to move on from wasn't necessarily the hardest thing to do in his entire life, but that's what he said. And he had a nice little quote about just kind of why it was so difficult and why he feels Justin Fields still has a lot in the tank. And it's what, and it's kind of the sentiment that a lot of us have when it comes to Justin Fields. So I'm just going to read it. It's really cool to hear this coming from Ryan Poles. There was a choppy start in his rookie year. And when I came in, we had some cleaning up to do, which delayed another year of adding talent and supporting cast. And then in terms of the game, I feel like he was making strides and improving. But it's really the timeline and how much runway you have. Because to get a guy up off the ground, you need to support him with as much talent as possible. And that, and then that flips because it takes so much cap space. So basically, the clock was ticking on Justin Fields. And it was just the the timing just did not work out for him to be a Chicago Bear. Ryan Pohl still feels that he has a lot left in the tank. Mike Tomlin even came out yesterday and said that there's a lot of meat left on the bone when it comes to Justin Fields. And frankly, I believe it. I really don't understand all this hate from Justin Fields. He's had absolutely no supporting cast. He's had a terrible offensive line. Matt Eberflus doesn't know how to call an offense. Matt Nagy doesn't know how to call an offense. And it has just been terrible year in year out for Justin Fields and we finally saw his best season yet last year when he finally had a weapon in DJ Moore and yet you know despite the positive strides we've all kind of jumped off of Justin Fields so again I'm saying I really think the Steelers have their franchise quarterback and I really do think that this guy's going to start by the end of the year and I urge you guys to get Justin Fields for cheap if you can I've had lots of struggles trying to get Justin Fields for cheap. Anyone that has him is holding on tight uh, because, you know, it's a sunken cost at this point. You might as well hold. But if you can, if someone has finally jumped ship, I would swoop in if you can. But either way, this is really cool quote coming from Ryan Poles, general manager of the Bears, saying there's still a lot left in the tank. And really, it was just a passing of two ships on why he had to move from Chicago and can't be the quarterback anymore. It was just uh, eventually they were going to have to pay Justin Fields and you can't pay Justin Fields and have a supporting cast at this current time. So it was just time to move on, unfortunately. So we'll then move on to. Do I have any other quarterback stuff? Yeah, we'll 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 just keep going quarterbacks. We'll we'll move on through the quarterbacks. Daniel Jones yesterday, uh, by Brian Dable said that you know when when Daniel Jones gets back, he's going to be the guy. Uh, I don't know how much I buy this, but I don't hate it. I really really don't. I'm already on record this offseason. It's probably a bad thing to be on record for, but I don't know if we should be putting so much into the Giants season last year. It was just abysmal. Nothing went right. To where I just don't know if I can write off Daniel Jones yet. We saw so much from him two seasons ago. That's what led to him getting this massive contract. And for him to come in last year, basically have a, 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 a completely broken Darren Waller, no wide receiver core, a really bad offensive line. Uh, and it's just kind of a hangover after kind of all your expectations being meet last year or exceeded the season before. So now you kind of have all these high expectations going into last year. Uh, and, the, and the team as a whole, just kind of collapsed. Now, I'm not going to read into this quote too much and say that Daniel Jones is the locked-in starter. 
uh, for the New York Giants because they are heavily tied to a quarterback. But I am just, again, going to put myself on the record and say I don't hate that move. I think if I am the New York Giants, I don't mind giving Daniel Jones one more year. You've kind of already spent a ton of money on him. You brought in Drew Locke, who's a serviceable, serviceable backup. You really, really have to help a lot of this team. You've got to fix the offensive line. You've got to get some weapons. And a quarterback that you draft this year is going to go into one of the worst positions in the NFL and have a hard time succeeding. And so I really don't mind the Giants giving Danny Dimes one more year if he fails go Drew Locke. And then you've got a top draft pick next season. And hopefully if they did it right in this year's draft, They've got a better offensive line and maybe some better weapons for whatever rookie comes in the year following. But with all the money they've already spent on Daniel Jones, with last year just being really just a weird cursed season, I think it makes sense to go right back to the well with him. I really, really do. We saw a lot from him in 2022 and 2023. We still saw some flashes before the injury. And we are. And the quote from this is, we're not sure if he's going to be ready week one, but when he is ready, he's the guy. Uh, and that's just, you know, some sort of confidence boost to hear right now. If you man, if you roster Daniel Jones in any of your super flex leagues, I mean, you can't get any value for him. So it's probably best to hold on anyway. But to hear that he might actually be starting this year, the Giants may not be getting a quarterback in this year's draft, at least early. That's some good signs for Daniel Jones. Again, they've already paid him a ton of money. I think Drew Locke is a really serviceable backup if things go awry. And I really do think, as we'll talk about later in the episode, the Giants have a very interesting path this season. Um, in this year's draft. And I think that they should go offensive line or a target there, or maybe trade back to a team that could actually use a quarterback. Uh, but there's a difference between QB needy and QB wanty. And uh, the Giants right now, I think, are a little bit more QB wanty than a lot of people are trying to, ex to, to, to say right now, which then moves us to the New England Patriots, who are kind of in the same boat. Yes, they need a quarterback. They want a quarterback. But they need so many other things that, again, if a quarterback comes into this New England Patriots situation, it's going to be very, very hard for them to succeed. And I just don't know if that's the path they should take. You know, I've been saying it a lot recently. I think they should just get Marvin Harrison Jr. and maybe a quarterback in the second round because Bo Nix and Michael Penix will fall. And I think that those are some good options if the supporting cast is right. And I think that that'll save some money for them in the long run. But right now, Gerard Mayo has come out and said pick number three for the Patriots. Drafting a quarterback is the top priority, but all options are still open. This is the exact quote. Drafting a quarterback is the priority right now. But with that being said, you have to really be in love with the guy to take him at number three. So really all options are still open for us. And if you remember a few weeks back, we had a story come out about the New England Patriots saying if Jaden Daniels isn't there in or for pick three, that they're not going to go quarterback, that they're not that sold on Drake May. And that's what I kind of think he's hinting at when he says you really have to be in love with a guy to take him at number three. You can't just take a quarterback because you need a quarterback. I hate that philosophy. I hate it, hate it, hate it. Just because you need a quarterback doesn't mean that's what you should take, especially when you're the New England Patriots and you need so many things and you're going through a rebuild that's going to take a few seasons. You don't have to get the most important chess piece right away. You can wait. You can build around that chess piece. And then when that chess piece finally comes in, they're in a position to succeed and that team can finally take that next step. That's what I hope the Patriots do. I think it makes a ton of sense to build the supporting cast first. But as of right now, getting a quarterback is the top priority. And again, I will say that I think Jaden Daniels is a fine pick here. I just don't know if he's going to be there. I think he's going to go pick two. And I, Jaden Daniels at least kind of has the skill set to put the team on his back whereas a J.J. McCarthy and a Drake May just don't. They're good quarterbacks, but they're not entire offense quarterbacks like a Jaden Daniels or Caleb Williams are. And so I don't, I really, you know, I, I see this quote and I obviously see that it says quarterback's top priority, but then to also hear that all the options are still open, that they really want to be in love with the guy at number three, that, that says that they're not in love with some of the quarterbacks that might be there at number three, and they kind of want to see who they could pick at three and they might not go quarterback. They really might not. And I really don't hate it if they don't, I, I don't think that it would be a good move. And I really don't think that whatever, like a Drake may or a JJ McCarthy is that much more of a positive EV than a Jacoby Brissett for next season alone. Obviously when you look at the whole future and everything, having a younger quarterback is better, 
But I think Jacoby Brissett for next season, at least with the right supporting cast, would probably be just as good as a rookie quarterback. And then you can kind of reevaluate next season, probably still have a high draft pick, but actually have a supporting cast and an identity around your team going into year two of this rebuild. So that's kind of my thoughts right now on the New England Patriots. Uh, Fantasy Intervention says, don't put that evil on Marvin Harrison Jr. All I'm saying is, you know, the Patriots would be a really good landing spot for Marvin Harrison Jr. I know it doesn't sound great, but that guy would get fed. And we saw last season on the Commanders, Terry McLaurin's best weeks were only drives, really, with Jacoby Brissett. Like, his best fantasy week was three drives with Jacoby Brissett, right? Like, it was touchdown, touchdown, lots of yards. And so that's, that's just, I think that Marvin Harrison Jr. going to the Patriots really wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for fantasy football. You might lose a, lose a little bit of a ceiling, but I think it'd be really, really good in terms of his career because they're not going to move away from him. They'll have a franchise wide receiver, which is impossible to get in this, in this, in today's NFL. So I don't know. That's just where I'm at. I think, I think that uh, this year's draft is going to be very interesting. I'm excited to, to show you guys my mock at the end of the show. Which brings us to the final quarterback update I have on you guys, and that is on Geno Smith. This weekend, Geno Smith was announced the starter for the Seattle Seahawks by the new head coach, Mike McDonald. This is great to hear. If you guys will remember, at the Combine, Mike McDonald came out and said, I don't know what the plan is with Geno Smith and Drew Locke. And that rose about a bazillion alarms for me because I don't understand how you take a head coaching job with the quarterback position as a question mark. But he's come out and said that Geno Smith is the starter this season and that they brought Sam Darnold or not Sam, uh, Sam Howell in to be a backup for now. I still think that there's a potential that Sam Howell starts by the end of the year just because he does bring a little bit more electricity to the offense. But Geno Smith is a very good game manager. We've seen it from the last two seasons. You know, he's kind of just a good starting quarterback, you know, not the greatest in the world, but not the worst in the world either. And with those weapons and with that incredible running back, Kenneth Walker, that's a solid offense. And I do think that this new philosophy going into Seattle uh, will be good. We have, of course, the Washington College of off offensive coordinator from last season going in to be the uh, offensive coordinator for the Seahawks this year, getting that upgrade. And then, of course, Mike McDonald, who's a really good defensive coach. When defensive coaches become head coaches, I don't get that upset. I know a lot of people say that that ruins the offense, but look at what the Texans just did with CJ Stroud and D'Amico Ryans. Defensive minded head coaches are football minded head coaches. And I think that Mike McDonald is a guy that's going to be able to come in and just make this offense good and make the defense good. And that's what you're looking for with the with this type of supporting cast around Geno Smith. And I think he can excel in this offense next season if he keeps the starting job. I just wouldn't be surprised if the season starts off a bit slow for the Seahawks and they want to get a spark and they go to Sam Howell just to see what they got. Now, if that's the case, you know, there's also still potential that they don't stay with Sam Howell for very long and they go right back to Geno Smith. But I still think there's a chance they go to him just because he does have that arm. He does have those wheels and he just has a certain electricity in his playmaking style uh, that that would, of course, be tantalizing for a team like the Seattle Seahawks. And speaking of tantalizing teams, the Packers. Jordan Love came out this weekend and said that 2024 is the opening of the Packers Super Bowl window. He thinks that this is the year to strike. He thinks that the rest of the NFL has been put on notice last season. Now they're going into year two kind of as a unit. The team's getting a little bit older. They're bringing in Josh Jacobs. They're shoring up that defense. Uh, Jordan Love is ready to win in 2024, and that's just great news to hear. You love to hear the competitive, you love the competitiveness, you love to hear the drive from a quarterback like Jordan Love, and it makes you say wheels up to the rest of the Packers offense. If the quarterback has Super Bowls in sight, then that's what you want to hear. We've already talked about a ton on this show and a thousand other shows that the Josh Jacobs landing spot in Green Bay is immaculate. That's going to help the offense a ton, and I'm still a Christian Watson believer. Jaden Reed is still really good. And Romeo Dobbs has proved us wrong two seasons in a row. He's a good wide receiver, as well as the two tight ends that they have, Tucker, Tucker Craft and Luke Musgrave. They're both really solid. So this is a really good offense. The question is just what do they do on that defense? But this year's draft is probably going to be really, really nice to them. And they could still make a couple trades or free agency moves. There's still some players available for them. But this is a good team. We just saw them absolutely embarrass the Cowboys in the playoffs. Uh, they kept the 49ers close as well, uh, almost won that one. So this is definitely a very good team. And the NFC North is going to be very, very competitive next year. So I think you could use any Packer you've got as like a very good piece of your fantasy football team.
Jaden Reed, Christian Watson, Josh Jacobs, Jordan Love. Jordan Love, by the way, we talked about it on Trade Gods, undervalued, undervalued. I mean, this guy is still young. He has great weapons, great young weapons, and an offensive-minded head coach. And of now, of course, we just talked about Josh Jacobs again, opening up that offense as well. Jordan Love should be a quarterback one in Dynasty, especially in Superflex. And it's just not. So I would actually be buying Jordan Love right now, 100,000% 100, be buying some Jordan Love. And so I've got a few more quotes for you guys. Well, before we get into the quotes that I want to talk about, we'll go ahead and just break down this cheat. Actually, no, we'll use that as a segue into the draft. So yeah, let's talk some running backs. We have a couple good running back quotes to talk about. Then we'll talk about the luxurious need trade. And then we'll talk about my mock draft. So here we go. Saquon Barkley, as we know, is going to the Philadelphia Eagles, staying within division. And this is what Nick Sirianni had to say. I'm really excited about Saquon and the things that he can do. You know, he's such a dynamic football player as a running back and also the things he can do as a pass catcher. He's going to bring an element to our offense and our team. As much as we've seen him, all the highlights that we see on tape, from my understanding and all of our homework, he's a good leader and teammate to be able to add that to our locker room. And not only the playmaking ability, but the person is really important. How many times have I watched him on the opposite sideline playing him two times this last year, three times the year before, and two times the year before? It's like, man, we don't have to play against that guy anymore. Great. And he's on our team, even more perfect. That's exciting because we've seen him up close and pers personal, and we know just how good of a football player he is. Music to my ears if you have Saquon Barkley. You love, of course, to hear that you know he's just excited to have him in the locker room and not go up against him anymore. And it's just also great to hear, as you'll hear with the, with the next quote I have for you guys, just how much it means to play against another team. We talk about it all the time with free agency where these players, you know, stay in division really because another team has seen them play two times a year. We talk about, I, I know I, for some reason, keep talking about Colby Parkinson, but Colby Parkinson on the Seahawks has played against the Rams two times a year for the past few seasons. And it should be no surprise that now Colby Parkinson has signed with the Rams. Teams watch players on the other team, scout players on the other team. And if they impress you, they're very excited about adding you to their roster when they can. And they're going to use that player well, how they expect to use that player. And so I'm just getting very excited about Saquon Barkley. Love hearing coaches gush about their players, which of course leads me to the next gushing. And that's on King Henry. And this is John Harbaugh on Derrick Henry. Literally the same exact quote, but just, you know, about Derrick Henry. Um, basically, he said that he's fired up and has had their hands full trying to stop him before. Uh, but this is the full quote. It's a little long. We've got a lot of different things that we like to do. A gap, B gap, C gap, D gap, alley, or all the way to the sideline. You want to attack a defense. And that's important in the run game. And Derrick Henry can attack every single one of those areas just as well. He could come downhill. There's no doubt about it. He's going to get after that A gap. And he's going to make people defend the force of the football that, what? To force the defense to tuck in the A gap real nice. And that'll open up the rest of the field. And defensively, he's just real football. There's one thing to have a reputation, and it's another thing to have a challenge of defending you. Just the fact that you have to tackle him. If he gets ahead of steam, he takes he took a fake reverse about 70 yards against us last year in London. You don't forget those things. Those things sting, and they stay stinging for a long time. We respect him, and he's going to help us. Again, exactly what you want to hear. You just love to hear head coaches gush about their new signings. I'm very excited to see what Derrick Henry will do in this Ravens offense. And very excited to see the creative ways that they cook up the runs with him and Lamar Jackson. It's going to be fun to watch next season. He's going to score a ridiculous amount of touchdowns. Which brings us to the last news story of the weekend, and that is Legereus Sneed being traded to the Tennessee Titans. Uh, it is a 2025 third round pick and a seventh round pick swap. So not too much, but a decent bit, right? I mean, the Chiefs obviously, I guess, wanted to move on for Sneed or Sneed didn't want to play on the franchise tag. And the Titans, this is my big takeaway here. The Titans are gearing up to pass. We've already talked about that. Like, we kind of already knew what they brought in now. Tony Pollard, a pass-catching running back. They brought in Calvin Ridley, a pass catcher. They still have DeAndre Hopkins. Traylon Burks is getting healthy. Chico Conquo going into year three. And then, of course, they bring in Callahan from Cincinnati. This is going to be a pass-heavy offense next year. And you can't be a pass-heavy offense without a pass-defending defense. Because if you're passing that much, trying to score that many points in theory, 
then your defense has to be able to stop the pass on the other side. And a big corner or a good cornerback is a big part of that. And Legarius Sneed is just that, a really good cornerback. The Titans have a really good secondary, and I'm excited to see how Legarius Sneed fits into this. This just just more proof to trade for as many Titans as you can. Get Will Levis. He's cheap. Get DeAndre Hopkins. He's really cheap. DeAndre Hopkins is really, really cheap, guys. And I would not be surprised if DeAndre Hopkins bounces back into wide receiver one land next season. And then also, of course, Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears are good buys as well. I think Tony Pollard is an even better buy than Spears. Not sure how Spears jumped him in most rankings. Tony Pollard is the guy that we want. We saw it last year. Tony Pollard from week 11 onward was pretty you know, pretty much the Tony Pollard that we wanted. And week 11 was when he said that he was healthy again. So to see him actually produce when he said he was healthy is again, music to my ears. So I'm buying Tony Pollard. I'm buying into this Titans pass offense. Very excited to hear about this move for Snead. Just kind of further bringing the home, the point that they are passing next season, which brings me to the Chiefs. They're now cornerback needy. They are. You know, this is a team that last year was not good on offense. They were simply not good on offense. And a lot of how they ended up winning the Super Bowl was this secondary and was Legereus Sneed. They're going to need help there. And I think we talked about it with the signing of Marquise Brown. I think trading away Legereus Sneed all but guarantees that the Kansas City Chiefs draft a corner back at pick 32. I do not think they go wide receiver. I think the writing is on the wall here. I think that there's going to be a much better corner available at 32 than a wide receiver. Yes, there'll be some good receivers available, but a lot of those receivers will still be available at the end of the second round because through the first round, as we've been seeing in a ton of mocks and a ton of analysts and a ton of people just in general saying that there's going to be a lot of wide receivers drafted this year. That's true. They are not going to be able to get one of these top end guys that they're hoping for. They're really, really not. It's going to have to be a Roman Wilson that they pick at 32. And I think moving on from Snead shows that they get a, a corner at 32 instead of wide receiver. And they maybe get one at the end of the second round. And I think that that started with Hollywood Brown. I told you guys that I said that this signing of Marquise Brown kind of suggests to me that they don't think they're going to be able to pick a wide receiver to take the top off defenses at 32. And remember this came after the combine, this came with Xavier Worthy, like being mocked to them, Adonai Mitchell, Brian Thomas Jr., all of these wide receivers with speed being mocked to them, and then they still just go sign Hollywood Brown. They know the rest of the league. They know that they're not going to be able to get one of those guys at pick 32. They're going to have to get corner, and it's going to be someone like Mike Sainra still uh, to, to do that. So let's go ahead and jump into my mock. Let's go ahead and jump into my mock draft. I see a couple questions, but I did this this morning, and I didn't know that you only get one mock draft a day on PFF. So I do have a couple things I want to change here, but otherwise, this is pretty this is pretty lockstep on how I think this draft is gonna go. Uh also side note, I didn't do any trades, but I but I still think that this is how like you know a lot of teams are gonna end up drafting, uh, whether it be they have to trade up for someone or or whatnot. This is just kind of you know, just my thoughts really on like position they'll get, that kind of thing. Um, and my first five picks, as you can see, it's a real difference maker. Uh, and from the rest of the league uh, and people making these mock drafts. I've got Caleb Williams going 101, Jaden Daniels going 102 to the Commanders. And as I've been saying time and time again now the past few weeks, I've got Marvin Harrison Jr. going to the Patriots at pick number three, which made me think really hard about the Cardinals at pick four, but they still need a receiver as well. And I don't know why. I just think that Drake May is going to slip in this draft. I really do. And so I have the Cardinals going neighbors and the Chargers going Roma Dunze. I think that the Chargers and Cardinals both really need a receiver. I think it'd be stupid for them to trade back. I really, really do. Um, I know the Chargers have a lot of rebuilding going on and they could use the capital, but I think moving on from Keenan Allen, them whiffing last year with Quentin Johnston, I think they need to get a wide receiver. And I think it's going to be Roma Dunze as, you know, we just saw Michigan pair up against Washington in the national championship. John Arb or Jim Harbaugh watched him, liked him. He had a good game, a solid game, uh, and would have had an even better game if he wasn't overthrown a couple times by Penix. Uh, so either way, I think that's where they go, which leads us to the Giants at six. And I, when I did this, I had them picking Drake May, but I think this might actually be one of the trade spots. I think a team will trade with the Giants because as we talked about, I think that they will actually probably go this uh, Daniel Jones route. I really do. I think that they will try Daniel Jones and Drew Locke one more season. And I think that they could trade back here to say the Broncos uh, and they could take a Drake May uh, or a JJ McCarthy. 
So yeah, let's just say that. Let's just say Broncos trade with the Giants to pick number six and they get Drake May. That's where I'll go with that. I think that that makes a lot more sense than the Giants getting quarterback. And that'll open them up to kind of go whatever route they need to uh, when it comes up to their clock at pick now 12. So we'll go Broncos get Drake May at pick six, which then brings us to the Titans. They're definitely getting Joe Alt. I think that's about a million percent happening. They're getting the best tackle in the draft. And then that leads us to now the Falcons at pick eight, where I think they need interior. I've seen a lot of edge being mocked to them, but they went edge a couple seasons ago. um, And I just don't think that they need to go there yet. I know they have Grady Jarrett, but he's coming off a season ending injury and he's getting up there in age. I would like them to, to go interior, especially with them being heavily tied to some edge rusher free agency and trade moves. Um, I know they were tied to Daniil Hunter and did not get him, but they are now tied to, uh, oh, what's his name? And there's some other big edge rusher that they're being tied to right now, and I think they're going to get him, which makes me think they'll go interior and get Byron Murphy the second, which will open up the Bears to get Dallas Turner at edge. I know, I know, I know a lot of mocks have had a wide receiver go to the Bears here at nine. I don't see it happening. I really think Harrison, Neighbors, and Adunze will get picked by then. And I really like this top five. Like, this just looks so right to me. It really, really does in today's NFL. Uh, But either way, the Jets at 10, they have to get offensive line. Uh, And then that brings us to the Vikings at 11, where I think they don't even, I don't think they have to trade up to get J.J. McCarthy. I think this is all steam. I really, really do. When I'm looking at these other teams, they don't need quarterback anymore. I think only one team is going to trade up for quarterback. And I think that's going to be this giant spot at six. And that's going to be Drake May or McCarthy. I don't think that we should automatically lock in Drake May as quarterback three or two even. I think it could be J.J. McCarthy here. We're seeing a lot of steam. But as of right now, we're still going to go with Drake May. Again, I still kind of feel like this team is Will Levis-ish, where it's just kind of coming out of nowhere, and it might not be as you know hyped as it seems. Uh, but he'll still get really, really good draft capital from J.J. McCarthy. And I think he goes to the Vikings at 11, and I think that's a great landing spot. And then uh, we could have the Giants at 12. We could have them go to a Fontenot instead of the Raiders at 13, just because in this one, I'm actually having a trade happen. I am having the Broncos trade to six for Drake May. The Giants at 12 can get uh, Troy Fatanu from Washington, get a tackle, and the Raiders can get Quinion Mitchell. I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people think that the Raiders will go uh, quarterback here, uh, Michael Penix or Bo Nix, but I really do think that they will fall out of the first round. And I think that the Raiders, while they have Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew, I think that they would be better served getting a quarterback later in the second round, like like you know, like I'm kind of saying the Patriots should do. Uh, by picking Marvin Harrison Jr. in the first round. I think that the Raiders and the Patriots would be better served building around the rest of their team before getting the quarterback. Uh, Saints were going interior. Colts were going corner. Seahawks were going center. Uh, Jackson Powers Johnson, that's going to be a good pick for them. They need that offensive line. Jags will go edge with Jared Verse from Florida State. They need a little bit of an edge help. I know they've drafted edge before, but I think that they could use it. Um, as well as the Bengals. This is where it gets fun for me. I think the Bengals get Brock Bowers. We talked about this. I think it was a Daniel Jeremiah mock. I don't think Brock Bowers is going to get the high-end draft capital that a lot of people are expecting. Um, I know we talked about him getting drafted to the Broncos at 12 before. I just don't see it happening. I really like Brock Bowers to the Bengals. I think that that's a great landing spot. And I think it's also realistic. So that's where we're at. Got Fashanu going to the Rams. Mims going to the Steelers. Steelers will definitely get a UGA player. A tackle going to the Dolphins, J.C. Latham. Corner going Eagles, of course. I've got the Vikings getting Tyler Newbin with their next pick in the in this round. Again, I don't think they have to trade up. I think they're going to be able to get McCarthy at 11. Uh, and then they need, a, they need a safety as well. Uh, and might as well get the guy from Minnesota, Tyler Newbin. I've got the Cowboys staying in Texas and getting Adonai Mitchell. I think he'd be a great threat alongside C.D. Lamb. I think it's almost... Locked in there going wide receiver. Packers getting a tackle. Buccaneers getting edge. Uh, Cardinals getting another wide receiver. I probably could have done something different there. Uh, But Malik Neighbors at four and Brian Thomas at 27 getting both of the LSU Tigers. That's a real solid wide receiver room. They could use it, and I love it. Uh, Bills, I have them going Lad McConkey. I think they need someone a little bit more over the field or in the middle of the field, and I think Lad McConkey would be a great fit for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, Terry and Arnold going to the Lions. They'll definitely go corner. I have the Ravens taking Tyler Guyton here, but I think I'm going to change that to Xavier Worthy. I think they'll get the speedy wide receiver instead 
Uh, that's another one that I kind of regret. Again, I didn't know I only had one chance. I was actually going to do this live with you guys. Uh, but either way, uh, I had Ravens taking Tyler Guyton at the time. But the more I thought about it, I think they'll go Xavier Worthy. I think they would love a field stretching wide receiver. I think that he would go perfectly well to say Flowers and Mark Andrews taking over the middle, having a guy who can pop off the top of the defense and Xavier Worthy would fit excellently well in this Ravens offense. We've seen the deep shot guy in this offense year in, year out. I mean, it was Nelson Aguilar last season, if I remember correctly. He had some random games. I think Xavier Worthy goes to the Baltimore Ravens, and that's a lovely landing spot. I've got the 49ers getting a steal in Kool-Aid McKinstry at 31, and the Chiefs then also getting a steal at 32, and Mike Sane were still, both of them going corner. It's important. With the NFL leaning so much into wide receiver corner, is just as important as the wide receiver position. And that's why I think the Chiefs get corner again. I know they got Marquise Brown, but I, again, we just talked about all the wide receivers taken before the Chiefs. I think, of course, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, Brock Bowers, technically, Adonai Mitchell, Brian Thomas Jr., Lad McConkey, and Xavier Worthy will all get picked in the first round before the Chiefs get a choice, which is one, two, three wide receivers in the top five. And then... Not any more wide receivers taken until 24. So then four for Adonai Mitchell, five for Brian Thomas, six for Lad McConkey, and seven with Xavier Worthy. Seven wide receivers taken in the first round. How cool is that? I like that a lot. Uh, so that was my first mock draft. I think this is solid. I ended up adding a trade in after the fact and, again, had one pick that I'm going to swap with the Ravens. This was fun to do. I hope you guys like the mock. Uh, drop your thoughts on it in the comments, I guess. Chat kind of quiet this morning. Um, but, yeah. That is my mock. That's my news. Let's pop in, see if we have any questions. Let's see. LH got an offer in Superflex, trading the 202, 203, and 302 for Garrett Wilson. Yeah. Yeah, do it. I think that you obviously could get a lot of good value there with those picks, but you're talking about a, you know, a true top, like, 20 dynasty asset across, like, all positions, a top 10 wide receiver dynasty asset. You don't normally get those types of pieces for your dynasty roster for ancillary pieces like second and third round picks yeah it's a really high second two high second round picks and you could hit with those a hundred percent and i you know i think we will hit with those this year but roster space technically you're clearing up three roster or two roster spots and you're getting a true stud in garrett wilson i think you lock that in trader keep tony pollard keep tony pollard i really i don't understand the value uh discrepancy on tony pollard i really really don't he's going to be the lead back for tennessee next year not tajay spears uh and he's going to be really really good we literally saw it last year he was unhealthy for the first few weeks of the season when he got healthy he started going on a tear uh so hold on to tony pollard and probably even buy him if you can thank you all so much for watching this was another fun episode of wake and take and you guys were a great audience as always I hope to see you all tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern on the Player Profiler, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook if StreamYard decides to allow it tomorrow morning. And thank you, everyone, who listened on the podcast version as well. Keep on rocking wherever you listen to podcasts. You all have a magnificent Monday, a wonderful rest of your week. Uh, Yeah, have a good one. Peace. Hey, I want to thank you for being part of this broadcast. If you have any thoughts on it, leave a comment. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like. And if you want to see more shows on the Player Profiler channel, subscribe to it. That's how we know you want more.